But first I want to start, I want to ask you a question. Have you ever had, the, have, you, have you ever said this phrase out, out loud or maybe thought it in your head? You don't know what it's like to be me. Husbands, don't raise your hands, but how many times have you been in an argument with your wife or a disagreement and you have thought in your head, and wives, I'm sure the same thing, you, if you knew what it was like to be me, then you would understand. You have no idea what I go through during the day. Wives would think that. Husbands, we think that. Or, if you're, or think about in a period of mourning, perhaps something has happened, uh, a, a, close, a close relative has died, or, or somebody has cancer, whatever it is, and someone is talking to you and you so about it and, and, and is there with you, and you so wish that they understood what you were going through. And then when you do find someone, when you do find someone that knows what you're going through, man, what a connection, right? Like if you just lost your mother or you just lost your father or maybe someone has cancer and you're talking to someone who is going through the exact same thing or maybe just went through the exact same thing, there's such a connection there because they know what it's like to be you. And so we're drawn to people that understand what it's like to be us. We see this, we see this in, in support groups. I mean, that's, exact, that's pretty much what a support group is, right? It's, it's people with a common, uh, something in common. They've all lost a loved one or they've all had a child that's gotten sick or whatever it is. There's all of these support groups. We long to have people understand what it's like to be us. And when we find those people, there's a strong connection. We, 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 they know what it's like to be us, and so there's a, there's a sympathy or an empathy. There's a connection there because of this common experience, whether it be good or bad, because we so want people to know what it's like to be us. And if you did, if you knew what it was like to be me, and I knew what it was like to be you, our relationship would be so much better. Communication would be so much easier. I would be so much more confident to share my feelings, to share how, what's going on, because you know what it's like to be me. And so what we're going to celebrate and what we're going to behold this morning is that Jesus not only knows you, he not only, because we saw last week he was fully God, he, he not only knows you, but because he came here and he walked here and he was here on earth for 33 years, he knows what it's like to be you. He know, and we'll see what kind, of, what kind of effect that has on our relationship with him and what kind of confidence we can have in that relationship because Jesus knows what it's like to be you. Each week we've been looking at a promise from the Old Testament and how that is fulfilled uh, in, the, in the New Testament, how that is fulfilled in Christ. And so in Isaiah 53, there, there's this promise, there's this prophecy from Isaiah of what it's going to be like for the Messiah, for, for the Messiah who was Jesus when he comes to earth. See if this sounds familiar. He was despised and rejected by men. This is 700 years before Jesus came. He, will, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hid their faces. He was despised and he esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried out our sor carried our sorrows, yet we esteem him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. So we see the prophet Isaiah is talking about this Messiah and, and what it's going to be like for this Messiah, for this, human, for this human on earth. He's going to be despised and rejected by men. He's going to be acquainted with grief and as one from whom men hid their faces. Now, this is a nice way of saying he's just not going to be that good looking. Like, like he's just not going to be, he's, people are not going to be drawn to this Messiah because he's stunningly handsome, okay? And he's going to be despised and rejected and not esteemed and born of grief and he's going to carry our sorrows. 
this is what the, what the Messiah is going to experience here on earth. And then, in the New Testament, we see the fulfillment of some of, these pro, of, some, of this prophecy of what it's going to be like for the Messiah. It's, we saw this last week. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This is Jesus. So Jesus was there in the beginning. Jesus was God. He was with God, and he was God. And then, what we're celebrating at Christmas is that this Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He came down here to, to his creation, that his creation has messed up that his creation has, through their sin and disobedience, has created this terrible place. We saw last week that, that there's no way that we could ever get to God, so he came to us. It says in Philippians, talking about Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. This God that had created everything, that all things were made through him. He was there at the beginning. He came down and humbled himself and was obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. You know, as I was preparing this message, I wanted to to, I wanted to really focus in on what it must have been like for Jesus uh, as a human being to be here for 33 years and walk on this planet and be, be involved in all of, all of the creation that he, that he had created, but then who, who met man for thousands and thousands of years through their sin and disobedience and rejection of God had created this world that we are very much familiar with. What must, it, it, what must it have been like for Jesus as a human to participate in this world? And, and so what I did is I went back and I read through the Gospels. I read through the Gospels, the stories of Jesus, the accounts of his life, but, but, but purposely ignored the idea that he was God and looked at what it would be like for me or what it would be like for you, us as humans, to go through what he went through. So, what we're going to see this morning is Jesus knows what it's like to be you, and we're going to look at some specific things. So first, Jesus knows what it's like to be under attack. Now, many of us probably don't know what it's like to be under attack. We may know what it's like to be under spiritual attack. We, know, we may know what it's like to have people, you know, uh, connive against us. But Jesus literally, from, from day one, was under attack from the world that he created. When, when the wise men had, uh, were, were on their way to come see Jesus, they, they stopped by and they talked to King Herod and told King Herod about this king of the Jews. And Herod felt threatened that this, bo that this baby boy had been born that was going to be king of the Jews. And so Herod was like, wait a minute, I'm the king of the Jews. And so he ordered that all of the firstborn boys in this certain area be killed. And so literally, Jesus, as a baby, with, uh, with Mary and Joseph, had to flee for his life. Right after the, not long after they, they were born, Jesus was born in Bethlehem, they got, Mary had to get back on that donkey that she rode on, and they fled to Egypt and lived in Egypt for, we're not sure, several months, but maybe as long as a year until Herod died, and then they knew it was safe to come back. Uh, Jesus knows what it's like to learn and to grow. There's a verse in Scripture that says, He grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and with men. So Jesus knows what it's like to not know something. It's not like he was a, a toddler and knew all the mysteries of the universe. He had humbled himself. And think about his life here on earth, his ministry from the time he was baptized until the time he was crucified was three years. He spent 30 years splitting rocks with his dad, learning, working every day, being hungry and tired and hitting, I'm sure, hitting his thumb with a hammer, having a bad day, having a headache, getting sick, subjecting himself to all of the things that we have been through. 
on a, on a daily basis, grinding and working the earth with the sweat on his brow and, and, and people around him, was sin around him, people with bad attitudes. There are stories about his brothers lying to him. He knows what it's like to learn and grow, and he knows what it's like to be tired and hungry. And, ha- and he also knows what it's like to be underestimated. He knows what it's like to be seen as less than he is. There was a time early on in his ministry, there, there's an account where, where these people say, isn't that Mary's son? Isn't that Mary's son? Isn't he a carpenter from Nazareth? And you'll notice when you look at the scriptures, there's no mention of Joseph. And so, again, I'm doing a little bit of uh, maybe, but, but anytime they just mention the mother, they're not sure about who the father is. So there could have been some rumors of illegitimacy because, because we know that Joseph believed Mary when she said that, it was the, that the, the, it, I became pregnant through the Holy Spirit. But that doesn't mean everybody in Nazareth and everybody in Bethlehem did, right? So, so Jesus is starting his ministry and people are like, this is just that guy that's been splitting rocks for the last 30 years who's Mary's son, you know, Mary's son, maybe Joseph's, right? So Jesus knows what it's like to be underestimated. Oh man, does he know what it's like to be misunderstood. He knows what it's like to be misunderstood. He knows what it's like to be moved with compassion. There, uh, there's, a, there's an account of him as he's heading to Jerusalem and he's getting ready to do the ride in on the donkey and all that stuff. He's standing over Jerusalem and he's looking at these people that he loves and he knows he's going to be rejected by them and he weeps and is moved with compassion for Israel. He knows what it's like to have close friends die. So Lazarus was a close friend of Jesus and Jesus showed up a couple days late, and Lazarus was already dead, and Mary and Martha were mad at him. And if he had been there sooner, then Lazarus wouldn't have died. And at the shortest verse in the Bible, it says, Jesus wept. And Jesus wept over the loss of his friend. Even though he did raise him from the dead, there was this humanity of feeling that loss of his close friends die. Jesus knows what it's like. He knows what it's like when we're frustrated. He knows what it's like when we're angry. If you read the accounts of the temple, he went into the temple and they were selling, they were selling sacrifices. They were performing commerce in the holy temple. And so Jesus was angry and turned over tables and fashioned a whip and started cracking the whip to, to clear out these people that were defiling the temple by selling the sacrifices inside the temple. We see him angry at the, that the Pharisees and the religious leaders, at these legalists that didn't understand the heart of, of, of a relationship with God, and he calls them whitewashed tombs. We see him getting frustrated and angry. Jesus knows what it's like to be tempted. It says, we'll see in a minute, he was tempted in every way. He was tempted in every way that you have been tempted. He knows what it's like to be lied to. He knows what it's like to not be trusted. Jesus knows what it's like to make an agonizing decision. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane. He knows that that, that, the cross is forthcoming. He knows that the cross is getting ready to happen. And he's crying out to God and he says, God, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. If there's any other way we can do this except for this immeasurable suffering that I'm about to go through. And then after that, he says, not my will, but your will be done. He knows. It says that, that he was praying so hard that his sweat was like drops of blood. This is the, a human Jesus agonizing over about, uh, agonizing about what was getting ready to happen to him. Jesus knows what it's like to be betrayed. All of us in one way or another, odds are through our relationships somewhere, throughout however many years we've been on in this world, we've been betrayed in some way. Jesus knows, our God knows what it's like to be betrayed. 
Judas, one of his disciples, one of his, one of his, close, one of his close friends that he walked with and talked with on a daily basis, shared life with for, for three years, betrayed him, gave him up for 30 pieces of silver. Jesus knows what it's like when you've been humiliated. What, what could be more humiliating than being called the king of the Jews and having a crown of thorns put on his head and, and having to carry his own cross and being whipped with a cat of nine tails and being pretty much naked in front of all of, all of Jerusalem, being completely the God of the universe who created all of this, what knows what it's like to be completely humiliated. And he knows what it's like for us when we've been rejected by those who are close to us. All of us at some point, I'm sure, have been rejected by someone that we thought was much closer than they were, and they rejected us. As, as soon as Jesus was arrested, we see Peter denying him three times, and there's, a, there's such a sad verse in the Scriptures that says the disciples ran. Everyone ran. Everyone was denying that they had anything to do with him. They were arresting people that were being associated with him. And so everyone was rejecting him and disowning him. And there was a lot, until Jesus was resurrected, the, the, the disciples were hiding out and wanted nothing. They didn't want to get arrested. They didn't want anything. They were disassociating themselves with Jesus. Oh, how many of you, don't raise your hands, how many of you have been falsely accused? Oh, it's so aggravating. You've been accused of something, especially you kids, right? Like the letter comes home from the teacher that says you did whatever in class, right? And oh, I, that didn't happen like that at all. My teacher's lying, right? I'm sure that happens, right? We all know what it's like to be falsely accused. Well, no, Jesus knows what that's like. There was a trial in front of the Sanhedrin, and the, and the Pharisees were bringing in false witnesses that were testifying under oath that literally that Jesus did things that he did not do, or that he said things that he did not say. Jesus knows what it's like to be falsely accused. He knows what it's like to suffer the worst that this world has to offer. Crucifixion is an especially cruel death. If you look at the history of mankind and you look at the history of the manner in which they, they killed criminals, crucifixion is by far the worst form of death. It, it is an agonizing death. And you put that together with the humiliation and the rejection of the people that he created that he so dearly loved, he suffered the worst that this world has to offer. Now, one thing that Jesus did not do was sin. He doesn't know what it's like to sin. He knows what it's like to be tempted. However, we see, that we see in the Scriptures that him who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. In 1 Peter, it says that Jesus literally took the sin of the world on his body on the cross. And so while he did not sin, he knows what that shame and guilt feels like. He knows what it's like to have sin upon him. He took the sin of the entire world upon him. And so he knows what it's like for you when you mess up and when you, and when you have sinned, even though he didn't sin himself. There is nothing that we can experience in this world that Jesus has not experienced in some form. There's nothing that you can go through throughout your days, no amount of good things or bad things that you can experience that Jesus has not experienced. The, the Christ that lives in you knows what it's like to be you. And so what an incredible connection. What an incredible strong bond. Anything that you encounter in your life, you have, the, you have Christ in you that you can go to. And, and if you're looking for that support group, right, we want people to know what it's like to be us. Jesus knows 
He knows what it's like to be you. All right, so what's the significance? What is the significance of Jesus being fully human? What's the significance? What does the Scripture say? The Scriptures say that he's human, but why was that so important? Why is it so important that Jesus knows what it's like to be us? Well, first, Jesus' humanity makes him a sympathetic advocate. Now, those are two big words, but Jesus, basically, we're going to see in the Scriptures, he's advocating for you to God. He's advocating on behalf of you to God on an ongoing basis. We'll see here. Hebrews 2. Therefore, he had, to be make, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make propitiation or satisfying sacrifice for the sins of people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he's able to help those who are being tempted." So he knows what it's like to be tempted. He was here on earth for 33 years. He, it, it says there's that temptation in the wilderness. But not only that, Satan came and tempted Jesus on an ongoing basis. So when you, throughout your days, are encountering temptation, you can pray to Christ in you for help because he knows what it's like. He's a sympathetic high priest. Here We're going to see in a minute. He knows what it's like for you to be tempted. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness. We don't have a God that just sits up in heaven and has never been down here with us and doesn't know what it's like to be tempted and doesn't know what it's like to, be, to, to suffer. But we, we worship a Jesus who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. So then what does that do for us? Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace in our time of need. Do you see the connection? Do you see the connection between Jesus knows what it's like to be you, he knows what it's like to be tempted, he experienced everything you experienced, and so what that does is that gives you confidence. You can, that gives you confidence to go to God and ask for help to go to him and you will find mercy and grace in your time of need because he knows what it's like to be you. If you ever want to know whether you're forgiven or whether you're clean enough or close enough or whether he, God understands what it's like to be you, remember what Jesus went through those 33 years that he was here. And that gives you confidence. It gives you confidence in his grace because we have a high priest, we have an advocate who knows what it's like to be us. Your defense attorney knows what it was like to be you. And oh, wait a minute, your defense attorney is the same person as the judge. How, uh, if, you got a, if you got pulled over for uh, 90 and a 25, right, and you're worried about whether you're going to be punished, and you go to court and you see that the defense attorney and the judge and the guy that's going to pay the penalty are all the same person, how confident are you in the verdict? Do you see how much this forgiveness thing is rigged? God is the judge. Jesus is the advocate. The enemy is the accuser. And the one that's going to pay the penalty is the same person as your defense attorney and is the same person as the judge. And, and the defense attorney knows what it's like to be you. He knows what it's like to walk in, on this terrible planet and be confronted with the sin and, and disobedience, and he knows what it's like to have sin and shame and guilt put upon him. That's why we can go to the throne of grace with confidence, because he knows what it's like to be us. Jesus' humanity was necessary to bridge the gap between us and God. His humanity offers us a new spiritual family. Now, we're going to see here in these next couple of verses, and I don't pretend to fully understand how this works, but, there, but there's, a, there's a spiritual inheritance. There's something that is happening on a spiritual level. Not only, we know now because of Romans, not only did, are we 
uh, genetically in, inherited the, uh, from Adam and Eve. Not only is he our forefather, but we on a spiritual level have inherited uh, sin and death. We, we have been born in Adam. And so another human had to come to earth to interrupt on a spiritual level, to interrupt this lineage, this inheritance of sin and death that we were getting from Adam. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. It says, thus it is written, the first Adam became a living being, but the last Adam, Jesus, became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. The first man, Adam, was from the earth, a man of dust. This second man is from heaven. As was the man of death, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are, he are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of death, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. Jesus, God, came down in human form to interrupt this spiritual inheritance from Adam. When you place your faith in Jesus Christ, it says you've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer you who live, but Christ who lives in you. And so you get a new spiritual family. You get a new inheritance through Jesus, this spiritual inheritance, this second Adam, this man of heaven has in interrupted this ter terrible lineage of spiritual sin and death. We saw this in our Roman series in Romans 5. It says, if, for if because of one man's trespass, death, that's Adam, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass, Adam eating of the fruit, one tra trespass led to condemnation for all men, so this one act of righteousness, Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience, Adam, the many were made sinners. Through Adam's disobedience, we have been made sinners. Now we have a new Adam. We have this second Adam. We have this man of heaven. We have this life of Christ in us. By this one man's obedience, by Jesus' obedience on the cross, the many will be made righteous. Jesus coming down in human form interrupted this terrible inheritance of sin and death that we received from Adam. All right, and then lastly, Jesus as a human on earth is a beautiful demonstration of God's divinity being compatible with our humanity. You know, sometimes when we mess up and we make bad choices and the world's coming at us and sin's coming at us, we feel like God and I just aren't a good fit. That, that I just don't fit in. That I, we, we look at the righteousness and holiness and perfection of God, and then we see where we are and some of the terrible choices that we make, and we wonder if we're a good fit. We wonder if, if can me and God really be in harmony? Can me and God really be in harmony? And Jesus is a beautiful demonstration that the God, the creator God that is way up there, that is way up in heaven, came down here and demonstrated to us that we, are, we can be made, through Christ, perfectly compatible. Our humanity becomes compatible with his div divinity. Christmas is a time to behold and celebrate that Jesus knows what it's like to be us, is up there advocating for us, and is compatible with us, and has welcomed us into a new spiritual family. Let's pray.